everyone. Good morning. I hope your Saturday is going well. Welcome to our fall harvest, um, the final garden workshop of this growing season. My name is Katrina Lashley. I'm program coordinator of urban waterways here at ACM, Anacostia Community Museum here in Washington, D.C. Um, so I know that we usually have our, our usual gardeners who followed along from the beginning and also have very happy to welcome our new gardeners as well. I'm joined as always by our wonderful garden leader, Dr. Garden Facility, Derek Thomas. Derek Wave, good to see you this morning, Derek. And so we're now at the fall harvest. Um, and I was thinking back about um, over this past growing season, which was very much inspired by the work of my colleague, Alcione, Am Alcione Amos, who's a curator here at ACM. And she published um, her history of Barry Farms Hillsdale um, last year. And so Barry Farm Hillsdale was a, an historic African-American community that was founded right after um, the Civil War. Um, and as Derek and I were talking about Alcione's new book and kind of reading through and her description of the community and the various families, um, we were struck about how they went about um, literally building the community from the ground up, but also um, the importance of green space and stewardship of the land, which allowed them to do so. And so we're very struck not only um, of the community as a symbol of, I would say, independence, empowerment, and agency, but also of this idea of knowledge, connection to your various natural spaces, particularly your green space, as really key and essential to the sex of the community, especially looking at truck gardens. So truck gardens, uh, for those of you who are new to our programming, basically they're gardens in which produce is grown um, for sale. And so um, those people, families who settled and bought um, lots um, at Barry Farm Hillsdale, they would grow produce that they would take across the river for sale at the various um, markets in, down in central DC. And so we really want to dedicate um, this growing season to the ongoing legacy of connection to and stewardship of natural space that has been ongoing east of the Anacostia up to the present day. And so this growing season, we created our own modern truck garden inspired very much by what was grown over hundred years ago, but also adding our own special touches to it. And so once again, trying to engage you on conversation about the history of place, the history of this place, the museum, the history of your place, the history of the green spaces that you have access to, and the knowledge, really um, a real um, familial knowledge, but also community knowledge of our larger world, of our environment, of our blue spaces, but also our green spaces. And how with the past two years, I would say the impacts, the stress of the last two years, the upheaval of the last two, three, two years, people have really kind of returned to these garden spaces. And so we thought that this would be a great year to kind of have people think about, reflect on the history of adversity, but also the history of empowerment and agency that is present east of the river. And so Derek, I was thinking about this, I wanna get your opinion on this, kind of have you reflect on the success of our modern truck garden over the past year? Um, and why do you think people are returning to these green spaces? And how in many ways, why is it important for them to understand how accessible it is and how they're really stepping into an ongoing legacy, whether it be a community legacy or personal legacy or family legacy, and how does that add to overall um, health and stability and strength of communities? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Katrina, for that introduction. And you know, when we first started talking about being back in the garden this year, because last year we weren't, uh, and or we we were we were virtual. All of our workshops were virtual, so actually being back in the museum space, and we started unpacking the history of the truck garden. One of the things that I was struck with, well, there were several things that I was struck with, and since we started in spring, as COVID has rolled out, we have learned about a lot of the stressors that happen uh, to marketplaces. So recently someone was telling me that they had a really hard time getting eggs and produce at a grocery store. So things that they were looking for, they were out of or had, had not come in and things like that. And so the truck garden in its very spirit, if you will, was not only a way for early 
Berry Farm and Hilldale residences, residents to grow their own vegetables, but it was also a way for them to share and also a way for them to create commerce. And so, you know, you think about uh, the work that they had to put into the garden. You think about the, the joy that they probably had at harvest. And then you also think about some of the challenges that they had when you talk about they had to take produce at a time when there was no mass transportation across the river to a farmer's market where oftentimes they weren't welcomed to sell in order to continue to grow their produce or for whatever purpose they had for selling that produce. So I think the fact that we had a couple of successful harvests this year shows that we're on the right track. I think that as the garden uh, growing your own food movement, shall we say, continues to evolve. I think people are going to start seeing it not only as a hobby, but as something that's actually um, an add-on to, you know, say if you go to the store and there's no broccoli, we're going to harvest broccoli later today. Well, you know your broccoli's coming in a couple of weeks. And so it's, it's a really, really great time for gardens because with so many of the outside gardening is a way that I think we could at least control a little part of that. And I think that's what was at the very heart of the truck garden is that people who didn't have means were using the earth to create means for themselves. And that was that was what I took away from this entire series of garden workshops where we had the truck garden as the spirit of what we've been doing. And the other thing for people who are just joining in on Zoom or any of the participants that are here that haven't really looked up the history of the truck garden, um, please, Katrina, if you can send them the link to our colleagues book or if you want to go on Google and just Google truck garden and you'll see what comes up and you'll learn about how privileged we are to have the gardens that we have today. Okay, Derek, so that's, whenever that's you're ready, Katrina. yeah, so whenever you're ready, we're ready to, to join the work, oh, workshop. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, perfect. Um, any of my participants that are just getting here, Make sure you checked in with Margaret, get your bag. We're gonna be doing a number of things today. Uh, we've got some harvest that we're gonna be doing as far as continuing to harvest some of our cool season vegetables. We're gonna be prepping for winter. We're gonna be removing the last of the summer vegetables. I also wanna discuss seeds right at the very beginning. Um, we're gonna talk about the winter harvest and what are things that we can harvest throughout the winter we're gonna talk about maintaining and protecting your raised garden beds throughout the winter. And then animals in the garden. And of course, as always, planning for spring. Um, so let's get it, let's get it underway. Um, I don't know how tight we can get Dax, but I wanna just discuss and everybody that's in the workshop, if you can come on around here. We have, um, been discussing natives a lot lately and what i did this morning was i went through there's a there's a beautiful garden here at anacostia community museum it's mostly an ornamental garden but some of the things that are in the garden are also things someone was just telling me that they had just traveled and how the medicinal people were going and harvesting various plants so we have things that also have medicinal roots. Um, so we have things like the coneflower, which is uh, a really great medicinal plant. Um, we've got things like chives, which are used in everyday cooking. We've got another form of coneflower here. Uh, this is milkweed. And milkweed, as we know, it's a really great pollinator plant. Um, this is a plant called Lariatris, which is a native, and it uh, was used as 
form of starch. Then we've also got the uh, agacinth. As you can see, it has these wonderful flowers. But really, this time of year, what you're looking for is the seed. And so that seed will produce another whole agastache plant next year. The liriatris has become very popular and it's being used as a meadow flower. The great thing about the liriatris is in the summer, this is a plume of bright pink. So it's really attractive. It lasts for a month in the garden. It's a great pollinator plant, but then you get hundreds of seeds that you can actually share with other people, or you can continue to have your meadow garden grow. The cone flower is the exact same thing. What the, when you plant cone flower in your garden, what the goldfinches haven't eaten, so you're also feeding the birds. These are all seeds. And the interesting thing about cone flowers, does anybody know what scarification is? Anybody, any of my participants here, does anyone know what scarification is? That's one way that you can scarify a seed. But with cone flower, the natural scarification is when it gets cold and it freezes, the friction that's caused from the moisture rubbing up against the seed tells this seed that it's okay to germinate. And the reason that coneflower developed that way of growing is that therefore the babies will not be young and get hit by a freeze. So mother nature has it all figured out. We just have to kind of catch up. Um, and then of course, there's milkweed. And milkweed has been big, big, big on everyone's mind as we continue to see our monarch butterflies declining. These are the milkweed seeds. These are the milkweed pods. And when you were a kid or a kid at heart, you made a wish <laughs> and you saw all of that blowing through. That's the way that mother nature also disperses her seed. So she has a natural seed disbursement and that's gonna make sure that this milkweed plant continues to grow throughout the environment. So seeds, don't forget this time of year that seeds are really, really important. Oh, and the chives. If you're growing chives at home, the flowers are beautiful, but before it goes to seed, unless you want thousands of chives, make sure that you go ahead and cut these off. If you wanna share with folks or you wanna start new chive plants, then you can use it that way. So seeds are a very, very important part of the fall garden. Now Derek, we're also gonna discuss, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt. We have a question that I thought is um, what you're speaking about now. So for Ms. Dixon, do all milkweed produce pods? Yes, all milkweed produces pods. This is a, is a more decorative milkweed, which is more of an orange and a yellow milkweed. But we've also got the, the, the wild milkweed. Um, if you live in DC off of Military Road and Ohio, there's a big open field that has been dedicated for nothing but milkweed. And you can see it and they all produce pods. Yes. Yours, if mine at home did not produce pods, what did I do? <laughs> you probably overwatered it and over fertilized it. Okay. Milkweed likes to be in yucky soil, yep. heavy clay, no water in the summer. Just leave it alone. So you got to tuck it in the side of your garden where it's not going to really be cared for much. You can water it a little bit, but don't overwater. Okay, or if you or if you want to put it at the top of a hill so that it gets when you water it, the water drains away, it'll do good. Okay. Yeah. This milkweed that I harvested here is actually growing right on the parking lot, right on the asphalt. Okay. So every time the irrigation goes off, within 20 minutes, it's dry again. Okay. So you don't want to overwater it. Now, the other thing, remember we had beautiful sunflowers that folks took home this, this season. Well, 
the birds didn't get me. <laughs> or they got some of it. Watch yourself one second. <laughs> now, if you want to share with the birds, that's fine. But also, instead of buying sunflower seeds next year for your garden, you've got sunflowers, right? They are edible. Now, if you want to share them with the birds, what you want to do is you want to turn this right side up like this. And you can sit it if you want to if you want to watch the birds, you can sit it close to a windowsill or something like that. Once the birds discover it's there, you maybe have a day or two to watch them come and eat this, especially the cardinals. The cardinals love it. Edible. What you do with sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds, you take them and you can Google this. There's various recipes of how you roast them. Yeah. You wanna soak them in a salty brine. You wanna soak them in a salty brine. And then I like to add a little bit of just an organic canola oil and you put it on a baking tray and you bake it at about 400 degrees for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just to get the inside seed crispy. And then you can have your sunflower seeds a with a little garlic. That's a good idea. <laughs> you just like them. You just like them like completely au natural, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's another thing that our mother nature has given us. Now, the rest of these actually, this pod didn't get away, didn't get eaten either. So that might have something to do. Has anybody heard about the decline on the birds this year? Yeah. So. Oh, wow. There's been a, there's been some, yeah, cause see normally these sunflowers do not make it this long. And this is a different type. This is not an edible type. The mammoth sunflower is something that we can eat. This sunflower is definitely something to be left out for the birds. The other thing that you can do is you can store this in a paper bag in your cellar or somewhere where it's not gonna get molded. And in the middle of winter, you can break this apart. Let me cheat. You can break this apart and every so often sit some of this outside so that the birds that are still here have something to eat. Aww. And you know you've grown and not gone to the market the seed that you're feeding the birds. So we're gonna, what we're gonna do at this point, if the sunflowers are done, we're gonna go ahead and eliminate the sunflowers. Carlos, can you get the sunflowers out for me? Take those out. Thank you. So and, uh, he, he's gonna chop them down like that so it looks like bamboo? Uh, he's gonna, no, he's gonna chop them all the way down. Oh. Yeah, because they're not perennial. They're no, they're they're an annual plant. Yeah. So they're gonna take them all the way down. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave the 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 the, the, the it's not gonna the root ball is not gonna really completely decompose between now and spring, but it will somewhat. And we're putting some of that nutrient back into the ground, however little it is. Yeah. So we're gonna leave that area untouched, right? But, and that's a normal rancor, so important. And then what I'm gonna do on top of that, I was really, really fortunate. Um, the cone flower that we see in the marketplace readily available is Echinacea purpurea. The cousins to that, which is the real wildflower Echinacea is Paradoxia, and there's a third one, my, my Latin is not working right now. Anyway, I was able to find the real native coneflower. And so next year, what I wanna do in the back of the garden is have coneflower. And I want us to actually harvest the root and dry the root, which you can use in teas and tinctures. Okay, so we're gonna plant on top of where the sunflowers were, we're gonna plant in. 
the coneflower. And a lot of people that are watching, or some of you may say, well, vegetable garden, coneflower, this is actually a really important herb. Yeah. So it's cross-classified. You'll see a lot of people classified as a flower. You'll see a lot of people classified as an herb. So it just depends on who you talk to. Now, the other thing that we had in this garden, anyone that you were here two workshops ago, right? So two workshops ago, we planted the lettuce. Yes. And the last workshop, we harvested the lettuce. So what we've got left here in the front of this bed are the remnants of the lettuce. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to add in cabbage. And it might seem odd that we're adding in cabbage at this time of the year, but the truth is cabbage, kale, collards, broccoli, those are all plants that you can plant now because they'll winter over. They'll last for the entire winter. And next year you'll have a bit of a jump on everybody else. And I'm also gonna show you what you can do with bigger cabbage right now for next year. So I want some volunteers to do some planting. What I need for us to do is we've got a helicopter going over, so pull out any of these leftover lettuce plants and go ahead and take some leaf throw spread that across you can pull that plant out yeah we're not the lettuce the lettuce unfortunately it's too late to put new lettuce in because if we have a freeze in the winter the lettuce does rot it will not make it through the winter okay so go ahead and Yes, please cultivate the soil through there. Thank you very much. Put that along the back. So next year, what we're gonna be able to do is we've got a proper herb garden here that we're gonna work on today. But next year, what we're gonna be able to do is also harvest some coneflower roots. And when you harvest the roots, you can harvest some of the roots and plant the plant back. And that way the plant keeps giving to you and as a byproduct, where's the one with the flower? You also get a you also get a flower, so it adds a little bit of beauty into the garden. Looks like you've done this before. <laughs> now, why is she why is she working the cultivator like that? Just about three or four inches down. Does anybody know? So it's not packed yeah, down, but also you don't want to go down deeper than three or four inches because soil has structure, and you don't want to mess up that understructure, okay? So, and I don't think we're gonna use all of these. So if somebody wants, give me one more. We'll have a couple of these for takeaway. That's okay. All right, so while they're planting and now with the cabbages, just so you know, here, I'm gonna get you started. What I want to do is I want to plant them about a foot apart. Is that your cabbage? That's the cabbage. We're going to put them about a foot apart. Okay. So, and then in the second row, you can do the same thing there. This row of cabbage, we're probably going to go ahead and harvest today. So if somebody has, where's Margaret? Margaret, can you share your pruners with someone? And cone flower. If one of our participants can just cut the cabbage for me, all I want to do with that cabbage in the back, it's, it's young. And I'll tell us, we'll talk about what we can do with that, but we're going to leave the root in place because it's going to grow back. Albeit it's not going to be a perfect head of cabbage. It will grow back probably two or three heads of cabbage in the spring. It'll start growing back now. But what we want to do is just cut it off like that leaving about an inch, okay? So you wanna leave about an inch in place 
for this plant to regrow. And this, we've had a bit of a, a, a insect problem. We've had these worms that have been really loving our cabbage. So when you, if you take this home, the green stuff that you see is actually the droppings. We oh wash, my goodness, oh, we, that's droppings? Yeah, we, they're, they're hungry. Oh <laughs> when you take this home, you can use this for smoothies. You can cook with this. A lot of this stuff that you're seeing when you're growing your own garden, you don't see because they clean it up or they spray insecticide. So we're getting to see this. Don't worry about it. You've probably eaten one of these before. I hate to tell you. <laughs> um, you can use an all season oil, which is an oil spray. It's a mineral oil. Then you are not totally organic because a, 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 a purist for organic gardening will not use anything but like just a hard water spray or hand pick them. Okay. You can go in and hand pick each, each worm off on a, on a semi-regular basis to keep the plant clean. Mine at home has this everywhere at home spots all on them and I'm just like should I eat it or not eat it, <laughs> it looks I cut away from the from the stuff and I eat it okay. and if you're making smoothies no. it doesn't well clean up the yeah off. wash it off <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to jump in and cut the rest of my cabbage for me okay and try to um there we go yep perfect and so we can lay that over there where we've got the seed stuff. Ah, uh, there was a there's a trial right there. Okay, down to this garden. This was one that we put in. We put in the Swiss chard the last time. We put in the cabbage when you guys were here, right? Now the cabbage here is quite amazing. Margaret's done a really good job, and as you can see, this one's actually doing. What cabbage does, it's making a head. It's starting to close up. Time is not our friend. So this cabbage, we could leave and we could take the chance, but there's a good chance that it will get burned out. And what that means is the, the, the cold can actually burn it out. So I want the cabbage leaves. The leaves are just like what you would use if you were cooking cabbage in your greens. You know, you're gonna make some greens at Thanksgiving or this weekend, use it this weekend and next week coming. Um, this is perfectly, perfectly good. Cut it up. So we're gonna go ahead and harvest these. And the same thing with Swiss chard. A lot of people ask about recipes for Swiss chard. There's just Google recipes with this chart and you'll find a lot of different recipes. And so what we're going to do here, and I need another assistant. We're going to go ahead, harvest the cabbage about right there. These are going to be taken home as part of our harvest. And the same thing with the Swiss chard. The same thing with the Swiss chart. With the Swiss chard, what we're going to do, we're going to cut it a little bit higher. I'm going to leave a little bit of that color in the top. And so we're going to go through, bring this through. And we just go through and do that. And I need someone to come through here and do that with me for this bed. Are you my volunteer for that? Very good. The other thing that we're not going to do with this bed is we're not going to turn it or anything like that. Is the cabbage and the Swiss chard, the roots are going to stay in place from the beginning of spring. It's going to flush back out. We will not have a perfect cabbage head again. So we won't have a single cabbage head. We'll have multiple smaller cabbage heads that will grow off. Okay. And when we get over to the broccoli today, I'll show you what I mean. So go ahead and take that down, cut everybody up, put it over where we're harvesting. And if you don't mind, clean the seeds off of that so that when we're, or uh, 
Um, a, new, a new bag. Give me a new bag. So we can put the vegetables on a clean bag. All right. Who was here when we had those beets? You guys were here, right? Yes. Look at our beets. Yes. <laughs> so two workshops to go. We harvested the beets. We had probably around 30 beets. We had potatoes that we harvested. So it was a really good workshop. And we had a bunch of little tiny plants that one of our participants were like, yeah, this is not, not gonna be any good. It's not gonna work. We replanted them. This was actually a bed where we had romaine lettuce growing. So we turned the soil, we amended the soil, and now some of these are really ready to go. That one, that one, even though this one looks really, really good, it's not ready to go. This one's ready to go. And here's the interesting thing about a beet. Can anybody tell me why in the grocery store the beets that we see are sometimes four times this size? Hormones, that's a good one. But also, it's been jacked up with a synthetic fertilizer. Everything that we're doing here is organic. Now, if you've never had beet leaves in your salad, it's one of the best salads that you can have. And this little guy here, the flavor that this beet is gonna punch will be like you're eating 10 beets from the grocery store, okay? So we're gonna harvest the ones that are ready to go today. And the remaining beets, this time of the year, see this little guy's ready. The remaining beets, huh? because it's already started to turn round on us. When it's, when it's first starting to grow, it's just really a long root. When the root becomes bulbous like this, and sometimes it's not a big beet, it's a small beet. And this is a medium sized beet. So once it's gotten rounded like that, if it were just a root like this, we know it's not ready. Once it started to swell, that's the money part. So does this then stop squirrels from getting in here? Because, you know, I tried to grow beets and the leaves are good and I'm just glad they shave them to the ground every time. You can, um, for the squirrels, <laughs> you can take cayenne pepper, not red pepper. Get the big cayenne pepper at the big box store that you have to be a member of. Get the big thing of cayenne pepper and sprinkle and every time it rains, you got to do it again. Sprinkle the cayenne pepper on the leaves and on the soil. Because squirrels, they forage by smelling. The minute they smell that, the cayenne pepper instantly burns them. It doesn't hurt them, but it instantly burns them. They think something's wrong with that spot, and they go to the neighbors. I just started growing <laughs> arugula. I don't touch that because they don't like, like yeah, anything. Yeah, they don't <laughs> like the arugula, but, but, but they'll dig up the arugula. They'll dig up the roots and then they'll throw it. They'll like throw it at your doorstep. Ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> and wait till you get to the tomatoes. They'll bite oh, into yeah. every tomato with one, just one bite. And sometimes they'll sit it on top of your fence. But to answer your question, Katrina, the question was if the fencing was here for the squirrels. The squirrels are not our primary reason for the fencing. It's the deer. Yeah. The deer that come out of the park here, they will eat everything. And they're very hungry. So that's what we're doing that for. But cayenne pepper for the squirrels, it'll, it'll change your life. And you'll still be organic gardening. <laughs> um, this guy, I'm gonna leave this one in. And the reason I'm gonna leave this one in is because it hasn't really swollen a whole lot and it's got a, a deeper root. So this is gonna be a much bigger beet come spring. But what I am gonna do is just fill that soil in around there. And when you're checking the beets, you can just stick your finger in there and see how they're doing. This one has grown way too far 
sometimes they'll grow right on top of the ground mm -hmm. and they kind of stymie themselves. There's not enough active root around this part anymore. So we're gonna go ahead and harvest this one. And this one, I'm gonna show the young lady that asked me how we knew. I pull this one out. See how this hasn't started to get round yet? Mm -hmm. So this is not done. So I can put it back in. That's the good thing about a beet. It's very forgiving. So I'm gonna put it back in. And when we harvest it in the spring, instead of it being elongated like a carrot, we're gonna start seeing that rounding, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it back in its spot, bury it back in, and it's gonna be good for... Now, sometimes the little ones <laughs> are actually, that's bigger than our big, big beat, right? So, so sometimes the little ones are really, really good. That one we just checked on. That one we checked on. This one doesn't even have a root starting yet. I think we're almost done with our beets. Here's another one that grew right on top. And it's small, but I'm going to go ahead and harvest it. Because did you see how easy that came out? It's just, this has started to, to, to get hard. And it's not going to be conducive for growing anymore so once you see it growing on top it's gone well but if you're if you're in your garden you can mound soil around it uh -huh. to continue to get moisture to it okay. so it doesn't get really really calcified because the, the outer skin gets really really hard and then the, the only thing that's growing is the root right at the bottom so the beet's not going to be expanded this one's ready and so once again all of our folks that are viewing we just harvested you know a pound of beets maybe a pound and a half of beets from stuff that we were going to throw away in the spring right or and during our first harvest summer yeah in the summer so this is really great this garden the only thing i'm going to do with it for the rest of the season is just add some more compost and let it cook that's it we're moving over here this is the second crop of broccoli when 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 you guys two two workshops ago we planted broccoli in the museum's demonstration garden which is part of the living garden that the museum has we also planted some broccoli back here the broccoli we're going to harvest later is beautiful broccoli. There's no broccoli here. Can anyone guess why? And just take the, the visual cues. Why do you think the broccoli has not set? What do you think, Stymie? What? The bugs. The bugs. We've got a whole family of them right here. There's daddy bug. Mama bug, baby bug, <laughs> or their cousins. They're really ravishing the broccoli. They're enjoying the broccoli a lot, okay? Now, what we're gonna do, because chances are there's more eggs that have been laid here. If these hatch out, right? They're going to need something to eat over the winter. What I'm going to do for next year, because we're organic gardening, you're, they're going to go and hopefully a bird is going to have a meal. <laughs> but we're going to get rid of this broccoli. OK, and we're not going to plant anything here because this is the third time that this bed has had that happen. If you were gardening at home, what would be a good idea to do is to take a week long break in between spring and summer and don't have any plants in the bed. Because that way we're sure that any, because the eggs, the insects are gonna lay the eggs on the plant mm -hmm. because that's what they want. They're, the worms, the butterfly that laid that wanted to make sure, and it's those little white moths. That's what that, that larvae is. 
So they wanted to make sure that those eggs had something to eat. Yes. If we take away the food source, even for a week, Mm -hmm. sometimes that's enough to break that chain okay because the eggs that sit in the ground nematodes which is a bacteria in the ground is going to eat away at that okay that's why we want healthy soil because the bacteria in the soil will will eat away at certain we'll serve as your pests. Pesticide. right <laughs> uh-huh so i've had a leaf hopper invasion and oh. I tried everything, like every predator bug, and is it the same thing, or if you just cut everything down? Yeah, the leaf hoppers. She's got leaf hoppers, and that's yeah, that's like the cicada that doesn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you've probably got good stuff for it. So yeah, I would go ahead, and you're going into the with with an insect like leaf hoppers or caddy dids or. There's a bunch of other insects that are really, really pervasive because they can jump away and they can come back. What you might want to do this winter is do some buckwheat. This is a winter crop and then turn it over in a month and let that nitrogen cook. Um, you might want to do, uh, I wouldn't do clover because then you'll be pulling it out forever. But if it was going to be like um, an ornamental, garden you could maybe think about clover but do something like a buckwheat and this time in november turn it over turn those grass plants over and let it stay all winter and then think about late february early march to put in your next round of plants okay. so who's got my pruners pass those on pass those on to the next person that's going to be that's going to be uh, <laughs> put to work to, today. I was, I was, I was get back okay. <laughs> now, do not throw away my broccoli. I was say, we're eating that, right? That's we're eating that. Yes, That's yes. part of our harvest. No problem. Do not, if you have not had a salad with broccoli, leaf. You see, the grocery store doesn't sell us that. Broccoli leaf is the sweetest leaf. Anybody that has tried this after I told you, yes. you you can you yes. can vouch for me, right? Ago. Put it on my radar. Yes. <laughs> and I actually grow it for the leaves because I never get a full head. So well, you're going to get a full head today because I don't know if you saw the demonstration <laughs> garden, did. how beautiful our broccoli is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, we're going to use the leaves today and we're going to take the leaves. It's all about the leaves. Say it leaves. again. <laughs> we're going to take home some leaves. We're going to try not to take home any of these, these, these critters. Um because they uh they need to go to the birds and the birds will find them and even if now here's a here's a thing what was going to happen to this worm if i leave it in the soil and grow you want to guess if you leave it in the soil if i just left it there what's <laughs> going to happen if a bird doesn't find it, They'll find it later. it's not going to have anything to eat because we're going to leave this without anything so it's not going to get to the stage of pupating and turning into a cocoon because it is not ready. It's not at that stage. So it will die and it's going to become part of our nutrients. So why not use our pest? <laughs> Don't do this with, with um, like weed, weed grass and the bindweed and all that stuff because that you'll never get rid of. But when it's an insect, and it's a it's a neutral insect like a like a like a worm. You can just leave it there. If the bird doesn't get it, Mother Nature will, mm -hmm. and it, it's not going to be able to pupate and produce the next cycle. So, all right. So we're gonna work on this. Let's go check on our Swiss chard bed and see how we did over there. Eric, do Katrina, have do we have any questions? Yeah, yeah. So the first question from Miss Bell. How do you prevent the spots on the beet leaves? The spots on the leaves? On the beet leaves. How do you prevent the spots on the beet leaves? Okay, so this is what we're talking about. This is not only spots. So the question from one of the virtual participants is how do we prevent the spots on the beet leaf? Here's the thing. Uh, and let me see one of the uh, let me see one of the broccoli leaves also. 
See the broccoli leaves have it too. If you can see, it's got holes, it's got spots, it's got all of that. What we have to do, we have to start rethinking how, here we go, can we take that one? Thank you. We have to start rethinking what we think is nice mm -hmm. and what we think is not nice. Because we've been trained up that a green pepper should be beautiful yeah. and yeah. big yeah. and fat. Yeah. And we've been trained up that the lettuce leaves should be perfect. Yes. Well, in fact, and I'm gonna stand, give me my, give me my six feet distance, Dax. There's nothing wrong with this is amazing. The taste is amazing. The fact that it's got a few spots, who cares? <laughs> so if we're growing organic, what we are going to see, we're going to see some inconsistencies in the leaf. But the flavor, I think that B agrees with me. Uh, the flavor that we get from the food and the fact that we can just eat it right out of the ground like that, it's worth a couple of spots. So there's really nothing we can do to prevent those spots. Now, question, this is your Swiss chard, right? This is beets. Oh, this is beets. Now, I know you didn't choose the beets themselves aren't ready. Can you take off leaves for a lunch without disturbing? Did we, did our participants hear that question, Katrina? Could you, could you repeat the question, Derek? Uh, so one of our on-site participants wants to know, with the beets, can we take off leaves for lunch? And the answer is absolutely yes. What you want to do with a beet plant though, and I'll show you real quick. If you want to take off your leaves for lunch, go from the outside and leave the inner leaves, okay? Don't go, leave a little bit of a, leave a little bit of height on the leaf, but go from the outside and leave the inner leaves. So take the older leaf, off and leave the inner leaves. Yeah. So here's some more stuff for our harvest. So we're gonna go check on this garden. Katrina, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Um so question where does Derek get his plants? They're always so healthy. Um one of the participants asked me sometimes in a perfect world scenario I can grow them. Uh, most of the times I get them commercially grown from uh, Bonnie, B-O-N-N-I-E. They actually sell into Home Depot right now. They're a great supplier. Um, and there's a couple of other suppliers that have local greenhouses. There's a couple in Baltimore. Um, if you Google local seedling growers, you'll be amazed at how many people are growing seedlings to sell to you for your garden. Any other questions? Yeah, so this is going back to the previous bed. Um, so the idea of leaving the roots in. So how, uh, sorry, um, so will a brand new plant grow from leaving the root? Could you talk about that a bit more, Derek? No, what, uh, what's gonna happen, I'm sorry, my glasses are foggy now. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen where we left the root in is it's just going to, now if we leave some seeds in there, we'll get some new plants that way. But where we left the roots in here, it, it's going to rot away because a sunflower, it's helianthus annus, which is the annual helianthus plant. It's not gonna regrow. So once it grows and it flowers and it seeds, that's it, it's done but we're leaving the root in place so that the rot will contribute to making our soil healthy. And as you can see, uh, if we can pan in here, we now have the beginning of a herb pollinator garden with the native coneflower. And we're gonna have an amazing cabbage harvest come spring. And we planted them tight enough that we can dig out every other plant as they start to mature and we can thin it 
And that way we can have some cabbage greens while our cabbage heads are maturing. Nice, smart. Now also back here, Katrina, second part of that question, where we left these roots, this is the cabbage. This is the Swiss chard. These plants will regrow. So the sunflower, which was an annual ornamental flower for the garden that we put in for the birds this year, will not regrow. These cabbage and Swiss chard will regrow. Any other questions, Katrina? Not yet, Derek. Okay, perfect. All right, so this looks perfect. We've got the entire garden cleaned up. And uh, Alicia, to your question, you could also, depending on what's in your garden, you could cut it back like this, but then you have to be vigilant for the next couple of weeks. And you have to check and make sure that any weed plants get removed and that all the way around, because that, that, that moss, that white moss that gave you, or you've got a uh, caddy root, right? Or no, you've got the uh, leaf house. The adults are done. So what you've got are now juveniles. So if you cut everything back, you're not gonna have any, there's not gonna be, the circle of life has been interrupted. And so you should be able next spring to have a garden that's free of leaf house. If you want to just, I mean, depending on what you have, if it's lettuce and stuff like that, go ahead and pull it out. If it's cabbage, kale, broccoli, winter vegetables, Swiss chard, beets, cut them down. Try it that way. And you'll know early enough in the spring if you have a reinfestation, and then you can clear it out for you. So, but this looks good. Any of the debris, what you want to do when you're doing your housekeeping of your garden, any of the debris, any of the weeds, any of this stuff, we want to go ahead and take out. Now, Margaret, can you grab that for me? Now, one of the things that we have to do in the winter, and I think we'll start down there and then work our way over here. This bed, Suddenly, I think we're on a helicopter flight now. So this bed was where the um, the broccoli was. We had some lettuce here. I need two volunteers to help me. And what we have to do here is we're going to take up. We shake it out like this. The reason we shake it out is because that way all of our good soil stays in the soil. We're gonna pull all of these out. That is a dill plant. We can leave it. Insects don't like it. We're gonna leave the dill plant, but I want us, any of these little things that are growing up, I want all this to go ahead and be removed. And then I'll show you what we're gonna do next to prep this bed and that other bed for winter, okay? And the reason we're gonna do that is because someone talked about squirrels digging in the garden. So two volunteers to pull all this up. I'm gonna to go to the My other bed. Huh? My hands are already dirty. <laughs> oh, okay, My, yeah. mine too. I don't use gloves. <laughs> <laughs> so while they're doing that, we're gonna go over to this bed where the cabbage and the Swiss chard is, and we're gonna winterize the bed. If you can grab that bag for me. What I'm gonna do, and if you've got a place where there's some big pine trees, and you know it's like in the woods, so you know there's no, chance of pesticide or anything like that. You can harvest your own pine needles. This time of the year, the pine trees 
of actually dropping their needles. Or uh, some of the stores are now selling organic pine needles as a bedding for like animals, uh, as an alternative to the cedar chips. So what I did was I harvested up some pine needles. And where's my, where's my participant that had the uh, oh She's helping and digging out. You want to come give me a hand, my young lady with the squirrel? What's your, what's your name? I'm sorry. Come give me a hand here. This is a way to prevent the squirrels from digging in the garden in the winter. And we've got a lot of animals that come into our garden in the winter. If you can get the fresh pine needles, Sometimes if you're just driving like along a wooded area or something like that, if you're in Rock Creek, ask the ranger. And if you see a big pine tree, most of the time Rock Creek is not, um, you know, they don't use insecticides or anything like that. Or if you have a friend that has a big pine tree, this is the time of year that the pine needles are dropping. And what you want to do, and see the light will get through here. You want to go ahead and spread this. And what happens is, if we didn't have our mask on, you would see it has a really aromatic pine scent. Pine oil is not attractive to most animals. And so by spreading those pine needles across there, it's giving a very light mulch. It's protecting it. And what's one other thing that the pine needles are gonna help us with as far as our gardening? Mm -hmm. huh? it it's going to keep weeds it's going to help stuff not from freezing but from thawing once it freezes it won't thaw and if it thaws it heaves because when the sun heats it up again it heaves mm -hmm. so it'll prevent it from heaving but the most important thing is it's going to help bring down that ph a little bit yeah because it's it's, it's a really acidic element that we're adding Huh? Heaving. heaving. Someone asked what heaving was. Heaving is the process where something freezes and then the sun heats it up and it pushes the roots out because the soil mass, that's why you can't put a, a, a glass bottle in the freezer that's full of water because when the ice forms, it expands and when the ice melts, it contracts. So when it contracts, the plant will heave up like what the beets did, and then your roots are out of the ground. So it actually, it pushes the plant up. So putting down these pine needles are going to protect our, our soil from that. See, this looks great. This looks absolutely excellent. And as I said, as long as you know you're getting the pine needles from a clean source, sometimes if you head out to Maryland, some of the farms, there's a couple of horse farms out off of 214 off of Central Avenue. And there's a bunch of big pine trees back there. Ask the owner, you know, tell them what you're doing. You're a gardener. You'd like to collect some pine needles. Most of the time they're gonna say, please do. <laughs> so, and it's a really, really great natural mulch. Now, the other thing that we can use the pine needles for is where we've got live plants. And that process is a little bit different. And I'm gonna get, who hasn't helped me yet? I mean, you're gonna help me out. And you're, come, come help me out. Huh? I, I know you've been helping, but I want you to help me again. What we're gonna do here, we're gonna actually skirt. We're gonna skirt this around each plant. And the skirting is we're just, we're just building a circle around each plant. The echinacea doesn't need. Okay. So we're going to take a little bit of this, bring it around each plant, and that just helps because what did what did uh, Anna? What did you say the squirrels did to your? <laughs> to they your... <laughs> ate them to the root. <laughs> they <laughs> ate them to the root. She had some plants. The squirrels went in, ate them to the root. Yeah. Right yeah. now. It's not gonna want a hungry squirrel is gonna eat whatever it wants. I've seen them eat green holly berries, okay? <laughs> so they're gonna eat whatever they want. But what it is gonna do, it's gonna deter 
them from eating. And what we want to do is kind of skirt it around each plant so it's a little bit difficult for them to get into the, to the base because that's where they go. They go right into the base. Mm -hmm. So we bring that around. We've got two more here that we need to do. We bring the pine needles under the leaves. They tuck it under there. And it's almost like tucking them in for the winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Night, night. So. Once, these, these don't need to come up. That was one of the old ones. No, leave it yeah, be. Yeah, leave the old ones be. The old ones are going to come That's up next. Uh, They're going to grow back. Cabbage, right? That's It's all cabbage. This is our cabbage patch next year. Now, the other thing was this year we had peppers and tomatoes here. Can somebody tell me why I'm putting cabbage here this year? What's that called? Mm -hmm. uh, Rotation. No, no, no. Rotating. Yeah, we're rotating the crops. And mm -hmm. what that is, the nutrients that the tomatoes and the peppers took out of the soil are going to be slightly different than the nutrients that the cabbage is going to need. Mm -hmm. Also, this cabbage is going to be ready middle of April by our April workshop. Wow. So we'll be able to put a different summer vegetable in here, maybe green beans. We did green beans down there this year. Maybe we'll do it up here this year. So we'll be able to rotate our crop and keep the soil healthy. We talked about that at the very beginning. Soil, it's the, it's, the, it's the most important piece of what we do. We're gonna continue to skirt this out. Katrina, how are we doing on time? Hey Derek, it's 11.31 and we have a, um, three questions. Okay, 11.31? Yeah. Okay, I've still got the herbs. I'm gonna head over to the herbs. I'll listen to your question. Folks, garden warriors, continue skirting out my cabbage. I want them to be well dressed for the winter. <laughs> All right. Yes, Katrina. Okay, so I'll ask these two questions hand in hand. So the first question, do you need to mulch the beds for the winter? Second question, what is the alternative for pine needles? The mulch, the pine needles is a mulch. The alternative for pine needles, you can use newspaper or brown paper bags or cardboard, if it's a, a thin grade cardboard, as long as you know that it's not a colored ink. Most newspapers are now using a soy-based ink in their printing. The colored ink, however, is still chemical based. So if it's a, and if you can find, um, I think the, the Whole Foods and the Trader Joe bags are actually done with the vegetable dye, uh, the printing. So if you can use a bag like that. So you can use any kind of a paper product. You could cut it, make, make that wrap around and wrap it around each plant as a mulch for the winter. You can use a shredded hardwood bark mulch. You could use a cedar mulch and you could use a pine nugget mulch. However, if the pine nugget mulch use a really, really, really fine one, not the big ones. And the reason is, is the big ones, if you put a big chunk of pine on the ground, it's a perfect insect hotel. So you've, you've given the insects free reign in your garden. The shredded hardwood bark mulch, make sure that it is the bark. Do not use colored mulch. The colored mulches are not regulated. So I don't know what the dye is, but I know when it gets on my hand, if it's red, if it's black, it's there for three days. You don't want that inside of you. Um, but the pine needles, shredded hardwood. And if it's the hardwood, make sure you're not using the inside. Make sure you're using the bark. The reason we would not use the inside of a, of a tree. Does anyone want to guess? Anyone here? Huh? Sap is one reason. Okay. Insects are another reason, but the primary reason is because the inside of the tree is all carbon. It's the, those rings, mm -hmm. those, are, those are the old growth. That's all carbon. Mm -hmm. What does carbon need when you put it on the ground? When you compost, what are the two elements? Where's the least? Where, what, where's, 
What are, what are my two elements in composting? Carbon and? Um, it's the green and brown. So the green, what is the green? Nitrogen. nitrogen. Carbon and nitrogen. If you put, nitrogen it's gonna take the nitrogen out of your soil. Mm -hmm. So if you use the innards of a tree, like you can see sometimes the tree guys are chopping up a tree yeah. and they've got the whole inside of the tree and they're giving away that mulch. Do not use it on your ornamental plants. Do not use it on your vegetable plants mm -hmm. unless it is there for two years and cooked mm -hmm. because it's going to sap all the nitrogen out of your garden. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can use other mulches, but make sure you know the source. Make sure that you're not using anything that's dyed and make sure that if you're using a hardwood mulch, you're using the hardwood bark, not just the hardwood. That applies to flowers too. The big thing with flowers is you can use the, you can use the mulch that they're giving away on the side of the road, but you're gonna have to add 10 pounds of nitrogen to get you back to, to base because that mulch is gonna sap everything. That mulch needs to decompose and it's gonna take from your soil what it needs to decompose. Yeah. We've got real quick, uh, my herb garden is in amazing shape. It's doing really, really good. And one of the things that we wanted to do with the herb garden is harvest some more sage. The sage has done really well and the parsley has done really well. So I'm going to get in here. I'm going to harvest. Oh, and I've got some arugula here too. I'm going to harvest my parsley. Now, when you're harvesting your parsley in the winter time, you can do one of two things. For our harvest, we're going to harvest everything because we're not back until the spring. But if it's in your garden, you can harvest one piece of parsley as you need it. You can leave all the rest of the parsley until you need it later in the winter because this is going to winter over. This is going to be fine. So you can either take it all down and freeze it. And leave it like that. Leave the parsley like that. Leave the crown intact right there. This was the arugula. You can do the same thing with the arugula. You can harvest it as you need it. Now, the sage. Our sage has been completely a success. And we've got Thanksgiving coming. Yes. So there's going to be a lot of recipes for sage. Here's the thing about this sage. If you take this home today, you put it in a plastic bag, do not wash it. Don't wash it. Put it in a plastic bag. It'll last three to four weeks in the refrigerator. If you add water to it, it's gonna rot. So if you want fresh sage, most of the times it's coming from California or outside of this country mm -hmm. in a plastic bag. And by the time you get it, it's, no fresh. it's a little herb pack yes. that you're paying $5 for. <laughs> and it's been sitting in that little herb pack for four weeks to get to you. Take the sage home today. The other thing that you can do with the sage, a lot of recipes will call for fresh sage. You can sit this out on a piece of paper, dry it, and then crumble it up and you can use the sage uh, um, powder instead of this sage because it's going to be the freshest sage powder that you ever use. Mm. So we've got sage that we're going to take home today. Oh, it smells delicious. Doesn't it smell good? Yeah, it smells all the way here. And the other thing about cutting some of this down is that it's going to be warm enough for the next couple of weeks that some of this is going to regrow. Yeah. 
is this whole garden perennial? These are all perennial? Yeah, yeah. The one of our participants, Katrina, just asked if this whole garden was perennial. It's the herb garden. And we've got oregano, we've got thyme, we've got rosemary, we've got sage, we've got arugula, and we've got parsley. Parsley is a biannual, arugula is a weed. So <laughs> outside of those two, um, everything else is perennial, yes. Basil, if we, we've got some basil for anybody that wants to take away the last of the basil for the summer, um, that's an annual. So other than that, um, everything else here is perennial. Katrina, how are we on time? It's exactly Katrina. 1140. 1140, okay. The annual throw, can you bring the basil in and still grow it in time? Yes, great question. The question, Katrina, was with the annual herbs, can we bring it inside and still grow it inside? You wanna get some sort of a light stick that is a full spectrum light. They have them now at the A store yep. that you can put under the kitchen counter. It's a strip and you can set it to go off for, for, for uh, two, six or eight hours. And that's where I grow out my basil. But what you wanna do with this basil if you take it home, you want to cut it down. So you actually want to go ahead and bring it down. Can anybody who's come to my workshops tell me why we're going to cut it down before we take it inside? A couple of reasons. You want to guess? <laughs> anybody? You don't bring any of the outdoor that exactly that's a good good part of it you can wash all of this off and you can um make sure but the the best reason that we're going to cut it down is to see how woody this stem has gotten and see how nice and young this is this is going to acclimate to your indoor light mm. a lot better mm -hmm. and you've got all these young plantlets coming up so you can even cut that back like that. And then you've got a fresh start on your kitchen countertop. Mm. But yeah, the bugs are a big reason that you would, because we don't know if there's any bug eggs or anything like that. So we would cut it down. If you take any of this home, do that. The other thing really quickly before we head up front, we've got some plants that we're giving you guys to take home today. The viola. If you've been to like a very fancy restaurant at your birthday or anniversary or whatever, you may have seen this as a garnish. Mm -hmm. Or and on a cake, I put some on a cake. You put some on a cake? Excellent. It has the most amazing taste. Mm -hmm. So I've actually started growing like violas and things like that to add into salads. And it actually adds a little bit of color to the salad. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bland arugula salad, throw some of these in when you're having guests over and they're gonna think you're like, I don't know, Martha Stewart meets Julia Child. <laughs> so anyway, th that's, that's one of the things that you're taking home. The other thing is in keeping with the native plants, yes. this is a native aster. It's one of the last blooming asters. You're gonna take some of that home. And the last thing I wanted folks to try in their garden at home is celery. Celery you can plant now, it'll winter over and you'll have really good celery next year. Um, and aloe vera, oh, 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 I almost forgot. So we talked about medicinal plants with the, with the native cone flower that we're planting. Does anyone know how to use aloe vera? Yeah, so you use it for cuts and wounds for healing. But how do you use it? You, you cut, you just break it open and you rub it on. Right. You break it open, you'll, you'll, you'll rub it on where you have a burn or a skin irritation or whatever. Mm -hmm. What you want to do when you, to, to cure the aloe though, you take it off the plant, you cut it, and you see it's very wet and liquidy there. And you just sit that on the countertop and let that dry. 
because then when you need to use it, it's going to heal itself. And all of the aloe component inside, all of the uh, moisture component that we want for our skin is going to be, it's going to ma be maintained. When you have a burn, if you have a burn or you have an irritation on the skin, you'll cut a piece and let it reheal. And you use it like that. And if you've got the plant growing, each time you need to get a new piece, cure it like that. The aloe is going to work a lot better. Great. Um, let's head around and Katrina, our viewers that are watching us may lose us a little bit um, because the side area, the Wi-Fi was a little bit sketchy this morning, but we're going to head around and we're going to harvest. The last thing of our workshop is we're going to harvest broccoli. This broccoli we planted two months ago. And when, I, when you see this broccoli plant, I just want you to think for next year, a lot of people think about putting broccoli in in the spring. We put our broccoli in in August. Katrina, are you still with us? We're here, Derek. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Before we get to the broccoli, and just tell me how I'm doing on time, Katrina. It's 11.46. Okay, perfect. Before we get to the broccoli, um, once my garden warriors make it back around, does anybody know what this plant is? Lavender. Lavender. Everybody's so happy about yeah. lavender. I'm changing my name. My name's Lavender from now on. Okay. The next time you see me, I want everybody to say Lavender. <laughs> that was, I mean, you guys went, did you, did you practice that on the way over? Everybody was like Lavender. It was like, it was excellent. Okay. <laughs> Can somebody tell me what's strange about this lavender plant this year? And it's all lavender plants. It's still in bloom and mine didn't look spent about a month ago. <laughs> lavender has rebloomed this year. And in past workshops, I told folks why you don't prune lavender in September. It's because it's a true subshrub and it never stops growing, it never goes dormant. So anytime you prune something, you elicit a growth response. This, I think, is one of the first seasons that I can recall that lavender has bloomed twice. This lavender was in full bloom in May, and here we are in October, and it's in full bloom again. Our seasons are becoming a bit mixed up. Mm -hmm. And as a result, our plants are becoming a bit mixed up. But for us, the great thing about this, and I want us to take some home today, we're also going into cold and flu season. Mm -hmm. Take home a sprig of this, sit it on a piece of paper and dry it out. Once it dries, about a week, because it's got a lot of oil in it, take just this top piece and get a canning jar, like a small canning jar with the lid. Make sure this is 100% dry. So week, week and a half sitting out in the open air. Drop it into the canning jar. Leave it for about another week without the top one. Shake it around a couple of times to make sure what's at the bottom comes to the top. And then every time you feel your, you, you get a, a, like a funky throat or what have you during the winter, Make yourself some tea and take one of these blossoms, drop it into your tea and have at it. Lavender is one of the best naturally occurring antiseptics that we have. So whatever bug you may have picked up behind your masks, take a break, take a little bit of lavender. 
it'll go a long way. You can even put some inside your mask. I put lavender oil in there. That's a good idea. You can put the lavender oil inside the mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's real, but it's but it's it's used in tinctures and things like that. But I love just the flowers. Just I I drop it. I have one of the tea balls, mm -hmm. and I use the loose tea. And if I've got a scratchy throat, I've got the lavender that I'll use for that. Now, two months ago, we planted broccoli. Most people plant broccoli in the spring. The nice thing about planting broccoli in September, well, August, actually, we planted it in August, August, is that you've got two months that are relatively cool, but the soil is really warm. Mm -hmm. So look at what happened. Now these leaves, once again, we can use for smoothies. You can freeze it, chop it up, use it for smoothies, use it for salads. But look at the broccoli that we're taking home today. And this, this little bit of yellowing that you see here, that's because it's starting to open. It's starting to florette. The florets are starting to flower. It's okay. You don't have to worry about that. It's not going to hurt you. It'll a lot of times it'll just fall off. See, it's just it's just coming right off. And so, look at that head of broccoli. What's broccoli running in the grocery store now? If you can find yeah. good yeah. organic yeah. broccoli. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And don't. I mean, even if you have a smaller broccoli head, don't be shy. It's okay. Mm -hmm. That's still going to be an amazing, broccoli. amazing experience in a salad. And they call them broccolinis um, too. Bro the broccolini is actually a slightly different, different place. I know, yeah, it's a baby. But we've got an amazing harvest. I'm going to sit my leaves aside of broccoli. And in two months, two months' time, lots of sunshine, a little bit of water. This is what we're ending up with. And you guys are going to take them home. And then what I'm going to do, and it'll probably be once the workshop is wrapped up. So next spring, next spring when you come out, we'll have more broccoli here. And it's not the broccoli fairy that brought it. It's <laughs> the broccoli plant. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna plant back 10 broccoli plants into here and i'm also going to give you guys some broccoli plants to take home so and we but can plant them now you can plant them now and they won't produce broccoli at this point but next spring you're going to have a four month jump on anybody that puts broccoli in the ground in early march okay. And so here's another one, if we can get a tight shot of this. And you know, Katrina, this is the perfect wrap of our truck garden series, because it just makes me happy to see that in two months, we produced wonderful greens, great broccoli. And this is the third harvest that we've had out of our garden this year. So it's it's been a really, really good year. It's and does anyone here have questions? Do we have any questions from our viewers, Katrina? Yes, we do, Derek. So here's okay. the first question. Yeah. How should white grubs be treated organically? Does growing cover crops, grasses, et cetera, produce more of them? I've dug into soil about four to five inches and placed the grubs in a bag for disposal. I don't want to dig up all the soil to try to locate other grubs. What would planting a type of would planting a type of plant be beneficial to reduce their populations? The first thing is there's hundreds and hundreds of different types of grub. And some of them are harmful. A lot of grubs tend to be more harmful to turf grass because the grass grows from stolons and they eat the tender undershoots of the stolons as they grow. But also a lot of the grubs that are in the soil are benign. They don't really do anything to our plants. So unfortunately, the animal that's 
laying the eggs and putting the grubs into your soil is going to be much more successful than you are at putting eggs than you are at digging them up. And so if you want to have a truly organic garden, there are, there are chemicals on the market that you can put down as a granular that kills the grubs. Um, if you lived outside of the city, the moles are probably taking care of the grubs for you. But in your vegetable garden, unless you physically see that you've got a grub that is eating your roots of your vegetables, there's really nothing to worry about because the grubs are underground. And as long as they're not causing havoc to your vegetables, uh, the, the roots, it's okay. Now, if you get outside of the city, there are certain counties in Maryland, there was a product called Milky Sporum that was put down and it's a, it's a biological spore that eats into the Japanese beetle grub. And Japanese beetles are very, very prevalent in Charles County and they will eat everything but they eat everything when they become the beetle. They don't really eat anything when they're the grub because they're feeding off of the micronutrients and stuff like that that's in the soil. So you have to know what grub you have and you can continue to dig it up, but mother Nate, there's probably many, every grub you see, there's probably six that you don't. So unless you have it where it's eating your plants, I wouldn't really, I'd go ahead and have a symbiotic relationship with them. And we have a question about slugs. Will certain mulches harbor slugs over other mulch types? What's the best way to treat slugs organically? You take a carry out, like a, a Chinese food carry out, the black ground tub, you know, the, that the food comes in. You dig it to the height of the ground. So you sink that that, that round, say eight inch Chinese carry out plastic container, you sink it in the ground, you fill it with beer, and then every day you get a fish net and you fish out the slub, the slugs and the snails. Because, and you put it on one side of your garden where you want them to be attracted to. And every once in a while you change out the beer. And that's the best way to deal with them. The mulch is not attracting the slugs, the slugs are attracted to the moisture underneath the mulch. So it's not that they're, but they'll ruin like lettuce and a lot of your leafy vegetables. So you can take the beer in a, in a container. That tends to work the best, but any container that you happen to have that's big enough, because they, they walk over to it, they fall in it and they don't swim very well. So, oh, so they're not living anymore. No, they're not living oh. anymore. You can add them to your compost pile at that point. <laughs> Actually, don't, because they may be filled with eggs, and you may just be, yeah. you may be just redoing the cycle of, of slugs. <laughs> there and and then the other interesting thing, biology lesson about slugs is that if you don't have enough male or female slugs, they can actually, they can become hermaphrodites and change their, their orientation. So you, you've got a lot to deal with with slug. Anyway. Um, so next question, what is a good companion to celery? Uh, that's a good question. Um, a good companion to celery. Um, you can add, it, it's, a good, it's a good plant to put in the herb garden because it needs a longer grow period. Um, you could do beets among it. You could do carrots among it. You could do um, Swiss chard would actually work among it. Usually when I do celery, I do a row of celery and it's very dedicated and it's in the sunniest part of the garden where because celery likes the most sun that you can give it. Otherwise it becomes leggy. Um, so yeah, any of those other plants that I mentioned could, could be a companion plant. And finally, um, look, going back to the pine needles, um, can I use pine needles and cayenne pepper together? Yes, there's no reason that you wouldn't be able to. The cayenne pepper is going to wash away in the, in the earth 
and it's going to um, not really cause any problems. And the pine needles are going to decompose slowly. So yes, you can. So no more questions on my end. Any other questions on your end? Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have questions? How are we on time? Are we just 11, about there? Yeah, it's 11.59. Okay, 11.59. Any last questions today? Thank you yeah, for thank coming you. out. Thank you for and, coming out. Oh. Yeah. We'll see everybody back here in the spring, right? Yeah. yeah. So all for attendees um, joining us on Zoom, thank you so much for joining us on um, your Saturday mornings once a month. We've come to the end of our growing season, but we'll be planning over the winter months um, to return to you in April of next year for our next garden workshop. And fingers crossed, we will be joining um, you in person on the garden's grounds. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. And so we're really looking forward to um, spending some time to planning not only more garden workshops, but also adding some other um, pathways to the garden, pathways to exploring how the garden functions in our communities and how we can be um, stewards and caretakers of our green spaces. So once again, thank you so much. I know so many of you have joined been with us for quite some time. And so thank you for staying with us through the pandemic, through virtual engagement, and once again, back in the garden. So take care. I'll be seeing out more information. Um, next couple of weeks, I'll send um, today's workshop um, next week. And we'll also update you. If you'd like to be added to our garden listserv, please email me and let me know. And I keep I the list to keep you informed as we prepare for next April. Enjoy the rest and of the before weekend. we, hmm? sorry, Katrina, before we cut down, can everyone here please give Katrina, who is virtual, a round of applause? Yay! Thank you. Thank so, you. We truly appreciate everything you do for us, Katrina. Thanks, Derek. So we will see you all next April in the garden. It's a date. Until then, please take care and be safe. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right. So.